Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheimer. Today for Pride Month, we're going to talk about elder care and the elder care needs of LGBTQ plus folks with our special guests, Kylie Madoff, Senior Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at SAGE USA, an organization that advocates for LGBTQ plus seniors across the country and provides a whole range of services. Kylie, it's great to see you. Great to see you. Pleasure to see you as well, Mark. Thank you for the invitation. And a reminder to our Zoom attendees that your questions submitted to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. So Kylie, I'm so excited. You know, I've known about SAGE for a really long time. Um, you were founded in, in 1978, and you're one of the nation's most prominent providers of services to, L, to elder LGBTQ plus folks. I think you're also the largest. Is that correct? That is correct, Mark. We are the largest in the States. And as far as we're aware, we are the largest on earth, actually. So talk about how you came, came about, because the story of your founding is really interesting. And then the trajectory of your growth and, and how you have developed over time is, is uh, doubly fascinating. So how, how were you founded and how does that inform your sensibility today? Absolutely. So I think one of the most amazing things about SAGE, and this was actually true of many of the kind of LGBTQ focused nonprofits that currently exist in New York City, is that they were born, a lot of them during the 70s and 80s, during a time of monumental change in the United, in the United States with respect to LGBTQ plus rights. So it was really a very kind of, how do I say, grassroots effort. It was people in the community coming together um, and addressing needs that were largely ignored, um, especially at that point in time by large society. The, the the, the need for, for connectivity, for healthcare, for access for LGBTQ plus older adults. And we were housed for a very long time in the LGBTQ, in the LGBTQ center in New York City in the West Village, um, which is which was also started like very similarly by, by the pooling of resources by people who were in the community by activists. And we kind of came of age in that space. And, and, and over time, we've really expanded exponentially, especially over the last five years or so, we've, we've expanded into outer boroughs um, into Brooklyn and the Bronx, I'm sorry, into Brooklyn and the Bronx. Um, we have a connection in Staten Island, and we're currently partnering with organizations in four different countries around the world um, who, are, who, are, who are providing services to LGBTQ plus older adults in their respective geographies. One of the things that I find interesting about the, the movement, the LGBTQ plus movement and the idea of, of serving people in the community is that it originated very often, as so many movements do, with the people uh, within the movement who were of, of greatest means and who were wealthiest, very often uh, white men and women. And then there was a whole internal discussion that needed to take place and still is unfolding about the internal divisions and the internal separation and the internal issues with, um, with diversity, um, equity, inclusion, um, how does that unfold as as the uh, head of, of uh, DEI um, within the organization as a senior director? How does that unfold and how do you see that history of dealing with, you know, representing a marginalized community and then dealing with it with sub communities that that themselves have been mar marginalized within the community and then dealing with the healing that, that involves that? Absolutely. So I think that what you're touching on has been a very prominent point of discussion at SAGE over the last few years. And so my tenure at SAGE began in 2021. And so prior to my joining, years prior to my joining, um, amazing colleagues of mine had really laid the groundwork by having, as you alluded to, very difficult conversations, right? Because most people at SAGE, of course, not all, but most people who work at SAGE um, identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community. And so we've all experienced um, kind of, uh, varying like levels of oppression connected to our identities right as members of this community however and it's a moving target right i mean as yeah. as things unfold and there's greater acceptance the the rejection shifts right different people become the target of of ire 
at different times. And then the community has to kind of gather around those groups and deal with its own attitudes, right? Precisely. And I mean, yeah, well, exactly. And that's why these conversations are so incredibly sensitive, right? Because it's not just talking about, you know, the kind of like the threat from without, right? Like, which is how many, like many like conversations around LGBTQ rights are framed as, right? Is, you know, this community being targeted from without when, when in reality, there are also many internal dynamics that are uncomfortable um, oftentimes to, to name and talk about. But it's something that my colleagues before I joined really led on for, for years. And it's something that I continue to do. And that I think that SAGE really leans into the discomfort, which is something that I cannot say for many organizations. But SAGE really embraces it for, for what it is and is unafraid of, of having bold, um, almost like envelope pushing conversations around these topics. Well, and we, we each carry our attitudes within ourselves, right? There's yeah. no human being who is immune from being human. But let's talk, let's move on a little bit, and we're going to come back to some of these issues. Let's talk a little bit about the kinds of services that you provide and the kind of apps you, you provide to get the, kind of the lay of the land. And then we're going to we're going to tie those services, which look like services that anybody else would experience, right, into the whole issue of, of dealing with the special uh, issues that different segments of this very diverse community uh, deal with. But talk a little bit about the range of services that you provide. Absolutely. So SAGE provides a wide array of services. Um, our largest uh, department is our programs team. And so that team is largely based in New York City, across the different boroughs where we have a physical presence. And they're in charge of what I would call our most um, direct client facing services, right? So that's creating programs like initiatives, like various kind of functions that are meant to engage our client base physically um, and or or virtually, right? So we have a, a virtual options like in the wake of the pandemic as well that are offered. So that's what our program team kind of focuses on. We also have a very, very large and like well-developed advocacy team, right? So we have an advocacy team based in DC that is focused on advocating on behalf of our community at the federal level. We also have advocacy teams based in New York State and in Florida um, and, and who are also targeted, who also target specific areas such as housing um, as well. So that's another large portion of what we do. And then we also have Sage Care, which is actually somewhat of a train the provider model where they actually create curricula that are meant for healthcare providers um, to essentially help them understand what it means to work competently with members of the LGBTQ plus community. And then of course, we have our communications teams that that, that do amazing work across the media landscape and, and several other functions, but those are some of the bigger ones. So you provide certain direct services. Yes. Very often organizations in this field of elder care do one or they do the other. Yes. Right? yes. They do legislative and advocacy and laws and so on and so forth, or they do direct services. Yes. Why is it so important and intrinsic to this model serving this community that you have both sides of that equation? Because I think according to Sage, the way that we see it is that both sides, so both of those kind of very large buckets feed and inform one another, right? So we think that our advocacy initiatives are strengthened because we have direct connection to community, right? So we're not we're not pushing for changes that are based on more kind of perhaps academic ideas or ideas that are derived from, from sources that are not kind of like in-house to us, right? Like we have direct connections to community. So we're fielding, we're listening to them each and every day as part of what we do. And so that informs our advocacy work and just makes us able to advocate in a much more specific. Um, but aren't you also trying to affect society and how society writ large? In other words, you're not a closed bubble in which you're just focusing on your programs or your advocacy, whatever. What you're actually trying to do is to ensure that that, um, LGBTQ plus elders yes. are treated outside of the bubble of this particular nonprofit or the, yes. your particular services in a way that makes society more inclusive, right? Precisely. For, for, for the elders that you serve. Precisely. And so that is the second part of my answer is that we believe in kind of upstream, as it were, um, 
prevention, right? So not just kind of like catering to the needs of LGBTQ plus elders that come into the door, but also, as you were saying, just now creating an ecosystem across the country of more, of greater inclusivity, of greater understanding for our community so that people who might not directly ever interface with SAGE's programs are also will perhaps interface with, with a healthcare provider who has been trained by SAGE, who therefore might have a better understanding of what it means to work with a member of the LGBTQ plus community. So we are absolutely looking to create an entire ecosystem of, of greater, a greater acceptance for our community. There are also some special health needs, particularly since a lot of elders who are uh, survivors to this day have gone through the uh, AIDS crisis and they might uh, still be taking uh, those, those drugs which interact with other drugs. And as you get yeah. older, the, you know, the accumulative impact on, on the body becomes uh, pretty substantial. Uh, trans individuals have uh, have other issues, and and uh, each segment of the community has very specific needs. Could you talk a little bit about how you address those needs in a way that's respectful of privacy, but also real, deals with some practical issues and practical needs that people bring to you? Absolutely. So at Sage, we don't have any healthcare providers on staff that are doing kind of like a direct a medical services, but we do maintain a very robust, very warm um, a network of of kind of safe providers that we are happy to refer out to. So if there's any sort of medical concern, that's how we typically address that: is like doing warm handoffs and, and connections to. And providers. you provide an an information knowledge base, right, so that members yeah. of the community can access. Absolutely. So that they themselves have the knowledge. And so we actually do encourage, right, so, like members of the community to, to create. So, so for example, Sage Table is an example of how members of the community can take action in their own locale and create a space for LGBTQ plus elders with Sage's guidance, of course, right, like with input from Sage. So we do have models that, that, that instruct on how to do that. Um, and then on top of that, like I'm sorry. Like was your question like was about how do we create space for people? How do you how do you serve? Diff, uh, how do you ensure that that different members of the community have their needs met through your services that address their specific issues? Absolutely. Well, we we really do encourage um, members of our community to share feedback in terms of what they're looking for. So we give them. So we do provide a lot of autonomy in terms of program creation, space creation at Sage, right? Like if there's a desire to create a space that is safer for perhaps like members of the intersex uh, uh, community, that is something that we encourage and support for member for for those who are Sage affiliated. Let's talk a little bit about identity and and the uh, moment in time that we have right now, where again we have specific individuals that are attacked. Right, you mentioned inter the intersex community, the uh, the queer community, the the uh, the trans community in particular is being targeted. Um, how does that affect what you do? I mean, one of the things that that seems to be an age old technique is to target within society the weakest groups mm -hmm. concentrate as much emphasis on on defining um the large group in terms of their attacks on the small group marginalizing 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 and then using that as a way to create identity for the larger group and then using that identity to create political power right and and you 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 see this do you as as an organization that is dedicated to elder lgbtq plus individuals do you have special programs that are uh, shaped to deal with this moment in time where you do have segments of your community being basically called out and at specifically attacked well, yes. And so there's two there's two primary ways that we respond to that. One is via our advocacy wing, right? And so we are at the front lines of the of the pushback against, you know, this kind of just like rash of transphobic legislation that that has been proposed in state legislatures across the country. We are at the front lines pushing back against that via legislative action days, via filling out kind of like comments on on laws like that have been uh, proposed and, and other measures as well. So we're very active on the advocacy kind of like legal front, but we also realize that this is this current political moment 
is taxing on the mental health of people who are being targeted, right? So specifically TGNB, transgender and non-binary older adults. And so we've worked specifically to look at ways that we can, again, leverage our network to create stronger mental health support systems for members of our TGNB plus community who might be experiencing greater levels of anxiety, depression, isolation, fear, all of those things because of these laws. And so those are the two primary ways that we respond to, that we are responding currently. The thing that I don't quite understand is that, okay, let's 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 concede for a moment that um, children fall in a different category. They're they're shaping themselves. They're trying to navigate. They change their minds and so on and so forth. But once you reach adulthood, and particularly elder adulthood, your identity is your own. It belongs to you. It belongs to no one else. Right. I don't quite understand why there's the attack on identity, on self-identification. It seems to fly in the face of everything that this country is supposed to be about, right? We're allowed to identify ourselves as whoever we want to identify as, right? Right. Well, in theory, yes, but 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 as I'm sure like you are well aware, of course, right, the 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 uh, core of the attack is actually, as we know, not about children. It's not about anybody in particular. It's about the 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 transgression is the is the existence of trans people at any age right like that is a problem and i think it's very is that that might feel frightening to some people of a certain political belief because i think that that challenges our assumptions about gender which are at the core of so much of our society right and again it doesn't make any sense and it is i would say it's very anti-american really to 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 want to police people's identities in this way but i think because gender is gender and gender roles like as as we conceive them as such a core part of our culture i think that the very existence of trans people is perceived by some as a threat to that hence this manufactured kind of like wave of anti-trans legislation that we've seen why do you think that there is is so much pushback in very traditionalist religious circles? And it, it doesn't really matter what the religion is. Uh, it seems that the the various organized religions, the the core of of the most conservative elements, seem to have this uh, this issue with uh, communities um, who. Um, don't adhere to sort of the, the the what has been viewed as the norm of of, of uh, heterosexual relations and, and identities and so on and so forth. Um, and how do you actually deal with people of faith who are members of your community who are trying to navigate one their faith and their their, their really strong faith, but also their identity as as adults. Absolutely. So I think that you're touching on something really important. I think that in previous decades, in the kind of social justice space, we didn't fully appreciate that. While, as you said, there are people who have been marginalized on the basis of religion, who are members of the queer community, there are also people who find strength um, from, from their religious tradition, their faith practice as members of the queer community. And so over the last few years, and luckily in New York City, it's it's pretty easy. There are actually accepting, for example, churches. There are organizations that are run, uh, for example, that are geared towards Jewish people who are who are also queer. The, I know there are also queer Muslim orgs and queer Hindu orgs as well. Catholics so queer... or or yeah, I mean all, exactly. all the different. So and and you get this sort of serial rejection. It doesn't again. You can change the name of the religion, right? You get the serial rejection, and then you have people of faith. Right. Who find themselves within this body and with this uh, within this identity and trying to navigate that it's it's a very very complicated emotional journey isn't it it i mean it is i i imagine it is for a great many people i mean i i i think what we at sage try to take into take into account in our practice is that while yes this must be um, a very taxing journey for a great many people it's also something that we shouldn't we shouldn't necessarily assume right that everyone's like relationship to their faith is defined by a certain form of trauma like the if for a great many people it is um but for many people it it may not be and so so we try to be respectful of that as well and as appropriate uh connect people to faith communities where they can be their their full authentic selves how do you see the evolution of the network of laws in New York, where you are operating, in terms of helping or hindering your work? Absolutely. In terms of like the network of laws, meaning like anything in, in particular or just what is going what's going on in society in terms of, of laws that come out of, 
or regulations that come out of city, state, yes. uh, environments, the, the network of, of services that are provided and who gets to access those services and so on. Do you feel like those, like the environment in which you operate is uh, maximally hospitable and egalitarian when it comes to communities that you serve versus uh, communities that might be served by others? Well, I would say if we look at, for example, laws that uh, that are targeted at protecting the trans uh, community writ large, right, like irrespective of, of any other sort of classifier, I think that New York State, New York City, um, especially that there are actually fairly robust protections. Now, does do legal protections equate to societal acceptance? Of course not. Like that's a much right. longer process as we saw in the decades following the end of Jim Crow, right? Like, like the end of legal segregation did not and segregation is thinking, right? And so, so we know that's a longer term project. I will say one area where I think the law, the legal structure of New York City needs to catch up with need really comes down to housing, right? Because surprise, surprise, this is an incredibly expensive city and housing is increasingly out of reach for a great many people. And while this might not be something that's coded as an as a LGBTQ specific issue, if we think about throughout the life cycle, the amount of discrimination that LGBTQ plus elders would have experienced on the job market being barred from certain forms of gainful employment, they are likely more 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 likely to be housing insecure or to not have a you know a, a large nest egg amass um, by the time that they're ready to retire. And so I think that New York City has a lot of work to do in terms of like providing access like avenues to affordable housing um, in 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 the city and in the state at large. It's something where we're just we are far behind and that is absolutely an issue connected to justice for LGBT plus elders. Well, economics is not far behind, but you're making a really important point. You're, you're, you're talking about serving a community where injustice and attitude and um, discrimination stacks up over decades. And even if it's healed today, it, it has a uh, traumatic impact on income levels. Yes. Right. It has a traumatic impact on um, on uh, physical state and and. Uh, emotional well-being. So you have to kind of take this whole calculus into consideration as you try to serve that community. Absolutely. And, and that's why we say, for example, food insecurity, housing insecurity, health, like access to health care. Again, these aren't always coded as kind of like issues that are specific to the LGBT plus community, but they absolutely are, right? Like what LGBT, LGBTQ plus people, elders are, are are people just like anybody else. And like, what are some of our base needs, right? Besides healthcare, food, and housing, right? And so, and and yeah, and so that's that is the idea that informs a lot of our advocacy work as well. And that's why we're so intri intricately connected to housing advocacy spaces and 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 legislation at the federal and state level. What does the future hold to hold for Sage, uh, Kylie? Uh, you know, organizations if they stop evolving they end up um, atrophying, yes. you're not atrophying. So okay. what what is your next five to 10 years look like? Well, our next five to 10 years, um, if all goes according to plan, um, our idea is that we will be much more embedded in smaller communities across the country, right? So SAGE has a significant presence on the Eastern seaboard from, from New York down to South Florida, right? So that, and, and that's fantastic. We have staff in Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, so right, so major metropolitan cities, but there are vast swaths of this country um, where LGB, LGBTQ plus elders live, especially in rural communities where we do not, um, where we're not necessarily um, connected, right? And so the goal is that we will be working much more closely with rural um, elders over the next five to 10 years. Um, we're also, we may also potentially be expanding our international kind of co consultative portfolio um, as well. I, as I mentioned, we are already in a few different countries around the world, but I think that that is something that may expand as well over the next decade. But you no, know, as you said, like if you're not growing, you're atrophying and, and, that, and, and that is not something um, that is not something that Sage would ever willingly um, engage in. So I think one of the things that I think is interesting is that what you're talking about, we hear from so many other organizations, so in many respects, you're no different than other, than other organizations as the world's um, population ages, as America's population ages, you're trying to provide more services where services are needed, right? And you have an expansion strategy and you're trying to ensure that funding matches the need of the uh, of, of, 
of the strategy. Mm-hmm. You're doing exactly what organizations do who 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 serve uh, elders of all stripes, right? Mm-hmm. You are evolving. Absolutely, absolutely, and just taking into account like ever shifting needs, um, and as you said, like trying trying to humble ourselves. It's like, yes, we're experts in the field, but we also are very much rooted in New York City, so we don't necessarily always, you know, know right, like what, like firsthand, kind of what's happening, for example, in a small town in Montana. So we so we try to approach expansion with like boldness, but also a degree of humility to let community inform how we can meaningfully work partner with people who are already on the ground in these in these communities and you're pointing to the need to evolve internally kylie madoff thank you so much for ex- explaining the strategies of of sage your history your approach to service it's been wonderful to have you here uh for this uh, pride month um and and thank you so much for the work of your staffs your board your funders and your community. It's it's just great to be informed by what you do. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure to be able to speak with you this morning. Have a great day and, and happy Pride Month. Thank you. Happy Pride to you as well.